perfect. Thank you, Cedric. And thank you, everyone else, for being here. Very excited to talk to you tonight. Um, let's see, are we all good up there in the AV? We were having some issues earlier. Okay, perfect. Well, again, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm Shannon Brownlee, co-founder and CTO at Valence AI. We are a voice-first emotion AI company, so we're doing vocal tone analysis of audio data for conversational intelligence. We're really aiming to add AI alignment to AI agents and just extra emotional understanding to human-to-human -human interactions. So first up, why emotion? That's the big question, right? When a lot of people think of an AI agent in a customer service or in contact centers, the first thing they think of is a lot of banks where you end up hitting the phone call and they go, oh, press one if you want to go to this department, press two for this, press nine for a representative, and you're just continually pressing nine as this AI agent tries to help you, but it has no idea what you want, right? And so we've come a long way in the past couple of years with AI agents and LLMs that can actually understand <laughs> what you want at least a little bit and can help route you to the right places, but they're not necessarily understanding your emotions. They're not responding in an empathetic way. So if they can't help you, they're still just trying to give you an answer, but not necessarily hearing what you're trying to say. And so with that, humans are inherently emotional creatures. We want to feel understood. We want to feel like whatever system we're talking to actually cares about what our problem is and is going to work toward a solution with us. And so we've really taken that into our product and into a lot of these conversations about voice agents where you know, people want to be understood and humans are going to be making their decisions on what to buy, what company to continue with, um, what bank they want to stay with based on those interactions. And so 70%, as you can see up on the screen here, of those um, buying decisions are made based on emotions. And we don't want to run into any more of those emotional miscommunications, lost sales, bad interactions. So I can show you a brief example up here of some voice agents where we can see kind of what a customer says, what a baseline voice agent using some of today's modern te technologies common in the voice stack are, and how different that can look if you're using emotion AI both on the text-to-speech and the speech-to-text side. So. So quick, simple problem, some frustration there that you can hear. And this is a basic AI agent response. I understand your concern about the $500 charge. It seems there may have been a misunderstanding regarding your card type or the associated fees. Please double check the terms of your account, and I will look at your profile on my end. So it sounds fairly realistic, not quite human, so it's where we sit in that uncanny valley of, it doesn't have the same vocal inflections, it's not really responding to, hey, you sound frustrated, it's not apologizing necessarily, and it's not adding any of that sort of empathy that you're looking for when you're complaining about something. And so adding in that extra little bit, you can hear in our last AI agent. I'm sorry to hear you're having this issue, and I understand your concern about the unexpected charge on your statement, I know it's frustrating to see unexpected charges, it sounds like there may have been an error with your account. Let's review your account details together to clarify the fees associated with your goal card. So you can hear in that a little bit more apologetic, some more inflections, maybe not 100% real, but a lot further beyond that second voice agent that we heard. So with that, it seems like emotion would be a no-brainer, right? So why don't all the voice agents currently have it built in? Why is it not everywhere? The question and the answer there is emotion is hard. Emotion is a very difficult problem to tackle. There are so many people who have tried, so many people who have failed, and it really comes down to how we want to look at emotion. And so for us, we started to go with voice because voice, we have found, is the best biomarker for emotion. A lot of people in the past 10 years or so have really leaned in hard to NLP, natural language processing, and sentiment analysis. Typically, sentiment analysis is just looking at the words being said, which can give you positive, negative, neutral pretty well, but unless someone specifically says, I am feeling frustrated, I am feeling happy, you're not necessarily going to get that actual emotional statement from whoever's speaking. So the example I like to use for this is someone going, oh yeah, that'll totally work. 
versus, oh yeah, that'll totally work. Those have completely different meanings in a human-to-human -human context, but when you're looking at a transcript, when you're talking to an AI agent, it has no idea what the difference between those two is and can lead to some very unfortunate outcomes. And so we've moved beyond sentiment analysis, not only with the technology, but in the ability to be real time. So when you're in a call, when you're talking to an AI agent, this is happening in real time. You can see this person is becoming more happy with what I'm saying or whatever I'm saying is making them more upset. With sentiment analysis, you're typically stuck with this state of after the call is over, now we have all the context and can see what points were maybe negative, positive. Um, and then on the other side over here, you can see computer vision. That's what a lot of other people come to us with, with why don't you also use vision? And the answer is, it doesn't make voice any better of a metric. It's a very marginal difference to have the two together. And if you wanted to look solely at computer vision, most of these uh, data sets and a lot of the research in this space has been in academia, in research labs, which is great as a proof of concept, but unfortunately does not work in the real world when you take into account bias in data sets. Usually they have 10 people come in, make a bunch of very emotive faces, and that's what they use for their emotion detection. Or you can consider when they're looking at these faces, there are all these special little lines, micro expressions, that you're not going to see if you're on Zoom. People have their filters on. They have their background blurred. They've got like beauty face stuff on Zoom now. Um, and so when you take that, plus differences in lighting, differences in camera quality, differences um, just in your Wi-Fi signal, is your video choppy? All of that comes together to make computer vision something that's not really viable in real applications, in day-to-day -day life. Audio, however, does have a little bit more of that. Um, it's, it's more normalized across different devices. It's a little bit more normalized across different platforms. And so with audio, we're able to get a high accuracy signal and high accuracy emotion classifications. Now, how did we do it? I've just told you about all the difficulties people have had with other um, methods of emotion analysis and why audio is the best one and why don't other people do it. The hardest part with this is data. So similar to what I said about computer vision, data is hard to come by. A lot of times it's in academia. They have five voice actors come in and do super emotive voices and they get good results from that, but it doesn't make sense in any real world context. No one in your meeting is gonna be up and yelling, hopefully, um, if you're on Zoom to get anger, right? And so we really took this when we first started and ran with it, where all the data that's out there, quite frankly, that's open source is bad. It's not going to build you real world models that actually work in production. And so we spent a long time working on collecting this data through various means, but our main ones have been crowdsourcing. So we were able to get real people and give them real situations and have them respond to that. So really trying to evoke those emotions and not just that, but having people self annotate them. So it's not what some random person six months later decides it sounded like you were feeling, it's what you were feeling in that moment. And so being able to have that with the intention behind the speech has given us a much higher quality data set. Um, and beyond that, we also collected specifically across diverse voices. So we really wanted to mitigate bias in our models. We collected across a representative sample of North America, across as many demographics as we could. So age, race, gender, neurotype, accent, geographical area, trying to make sure that every voice is represented in our models. And that helps us be more accurate across a generalized population and not just, you know, the four white people that compile an initial data set that a lot of people use. And the b even bigger problem, how do you model this? And that is the question that we get a lot and a lot of what our secret sauce really is. We have our own proprietary data processing that we do where we can extract tone, timbre, inflections of voice, and then normalize that across different voices. So it's not just, oh, this person has a higher pitched voice. That sounds a little bit happier. They sound more surprised more often. We're normalizing that across as many voices as we can to actually look at the change in tone over time to get the emotion, not just you know, a flat tone during the entire file. And so 
being able to do that, extracting the tone, extracting that pattern, and normalizing across those voices, we've been able to get classification models that are up and running. We have up to 10 different classes that we classify for with high accuracy. We're at 94% accuracy on, some, on most of our uh, production models. And so being able to have that high of accuracy across a diverse set of voices was really important to us in all of this training and data collection. Um, and within those classes, we have uh, the seven basic emotions of neuroscience and cognitive science alongside a few more nuanced states. So think like happy versus excited or irritated versus angry. And things like that can help gauge how emotions are starting to shift. Beyond that, we get to the modeling side after all of our lovely processing up there. Um, we actually do have a few different model types that we use. So a lot of people ask us, why not just throw this into an LLM and call it a day? Um, but we're really focused on making sure these models are not only accurate, but they're as easy to use as possible. And so we have kept a lot of our models within classical machine learning techniques. So um, CNNs, RNNs, LSTMs, all of those fun models going more with the classical techniques to keep our models as small as possible because we have customers that run on edge. They want to have this on device. Um, and it's a much more difficult task to do that with a humongous billion parameter model. So being able to do that, plus just having lower latency and cheaper costs for any one of our customers who wants to run this on-prem. Um, so that is how we have our models there. And then last but not least, our model output. Like I said, these are classification models, so we're looking at what this emotion was during a given sentence. That information is not necessarily only used as this person was happy and you can move on. We do a lot more integration with workflows, AI agents, um, and other multimodal techniques that I'll get into in a little bit. So I know a lot of people that work in voice have asked us this, especially recently. Why not voice-to-voice -voice models? How come those are not? going to just completely quash this. You can see here some of the biggest companies in the AI agent space, in the voice space, all make up different layers to this cascading stack. So it's not necessarily just voice-to-voice -voice models competing with one other model. It's competing with everyone else that makes all of this up. And everyone here is specialized in something in particular. We make up this emotion engine up here. And some of the other companies and partners that we work with make up the rest of this stack. And our big question to a lot of people that want to consider voice-to-voice -voice models and want to consider how come those aren't just inherently better. People loved GPT-40 voice when it came out, right? But wouldn't you rather have each piece of this specialized to exactly what you want? Wouldn't you want your own fine-tuned LLM or your own RAG connected to all of this? Your own custom voice that you want to use that's not just one of the random out-of-the-box ones that Eleven Labs or Cartesia has. So you can customize this as much as you want while right now still remaining within similar latency and higher accuracy. A lot of the voice-to-voice -voice models are very prone to hallucinations because they're trying to do too much at once. They're trying to do the text-to-speech, speech-to-text, the LLM, and in some cases, they're claiming to have the emotion part built in as well. And we just haven't seen um, high enough accuracy or good enough results from that just yet to think that it's even a viable option to include alongside everything else in these giant models. And so I've talked a lot so far about AI agents and how we can fit into that stack. But we do also do quite a bit in the human-to-human -human space. And I think that's notable to kind of show how accurate our models are and how we can move a lot of these human-to-human -human interactions and conclusions that we've made from these human interactions into AI agents. So we mainly work in contact centers, call centers, and you can see here, we give them this whole dashboard of real-time insights for what's happening in a call, how people are feeling, how emotions are changing. And the thing to consider here is, you know, well, why do humans need something like this? Oftentimes, when you call a call center, number one, you're angry or you're frustrated. And number two, you're calling someone halfway across the world. So most of these agents and contact centers and call centers are speaking English as their third, fourth, fifth language. And so for them trying to keep up with you know, their transcript, their tally of what you need, their CRM, um, as well as just listening to you, is a lot at once. 
And a lot of these contact centers have 100% turnover rate of agents year after year because nobody wants to hop on a call and get yelled at for six hours a day by someone in the US whose language that they're trying to speak that they don't necessarily know is a first language. They might not be fluent. And so being able to have this to help agents be able to get suggestions, AI suggestions, for how to calm people down when they're frustrated or when they're yelling, and at least bring them back to a more neutral baseline, and being able to keep up as things change quickly in these conversations for customer service has been very helpful to a lot of the agents that are actively using our products. Um, and you can see, as I mentioned earlier, over in this corner, it might be a little small for some of you to see, but we do have some multimodal approaches to our um, products. So down in that corner, you can see sentiment alignment. So sentiment analysis is still useful a lot of times, um, but the big question there is how we can use it as um, a proxy, sort of, to add into our emotion models. We're able to flag points of possible miscommunication, possible sarcasm or passive aggression where tone and text don't necessarily align. So if someone's tone is happy, but their text is negative, that's the moment where we can flag and then look at that later for review, perhaps update our models for specific clients or specific situations and move on from there. And then last but not least, just a few other um, applications that we work in. I've talked a lot about voice agents um, and I just went over contact centers, but within that customer support, you can think of video conferencing too, just in a meeting, say with your partners or your board or anything of that sort, being able to track how people are feeling and how emotions are changing in real time. Same thing for sales. What sales points are people interacting with well, poorly, and keeping track of that over time to adjust what you do. And then last but not least there as well, model evals. A lot of people want their AI to sound realistic. And it's a big question of whether or not it is. So I've seen a lot of people use OpenAI to judge whether or not OpenAI is doing well. Usually it says it is. Um, but having a kind of third party to dictate, hey, does this seem realistic? Does this match the output and emotion that you wanted? Um, has been a big interest for us as well. Thank you everyone for listening. I've appreciated this so much. I've got our little voice agent. Yes, we'll be around afterward. My co-founder Chloe is over here and uh, excited to talk to more of you. Thank you.